do you want to be happy? Is that something that you desire? But the strange thing is that if you pursue happiness, you don't get it. If you want to be happy, you don't pursue happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of other pursuits. You, you can't kind of isolate happiness off uh, and, uh, and seek after that. You know, if you want riches, you know, you can kind of find a way to, uh, you can find a strategy that will create riches. But it's something that you can actually get and aim for. But if you want happiness, happiness isn't something that you can isolate off by itself and find. Happiness comes as a byproduct of belonging, uh, of, of doing something else, of pursuing something else. But the question is, what can we chase? What can we pursue that creates true and lasting happiness? Where will you find great joy? Where will you find the good life that creates happiness? Our future is shaped by our pursuits. What are we chasing after? Where are we going? What are we directed and aimed towards? Because that will, that will dictate where we go in life and beyond this life. If you pursue the right thing, you will have joy and pleasure and life. But when you pursue these things for their own sake, you often end up empty. Because the reward is found by looking in the right place. Do you think that you could find lasting happiness in anything that you could do for yourself? Is there anything in you that could achieve lasting happiness the, the world is telling you right now that if you want lasting happiness you need to look inside yourself and find your true identity and open it up to the world and be accepted but i'm telling you now that's not where you will find true happiness you will only find emptiness there perhaps you think you might find lasting joy in the next thing that you will consume the next movie or tv show or uh, object that you will buy Will you find lasting joy there? Perhaps you think you'll find life in this world of decay if I can accumulate enough wealth and property and, uh, and be secure in life and, and, and get the picture-perfect family. Perhaps there I will find lasting happiness. Well, these things fall and fade away. They fall apart. We grow sick and old and we die. This world is fading away and there is no lasting joy and happiness in these things that are decaying and falling to dust. But this song that we're looking at this morning teaches us where to find true and lasting joy, true and lasting happiness and goodness. They are the result of belonging to the Lord. They are the result of finding refuge in the Lord. He is the true source of goodness. He is where happiness resides and he has joy to give, abundant joy, overflowing life that he pours out. It's a blessing. You know when you get a cup and you start to fill it up and it reaches the brim and then it overflows. That's like the blessing that the Lord has for us. Our cup overflows with him. But in order to find that good life, where do we start? We're going to start with King David. And what he says here in Psalm 16. This psalm we're going to look at in four parts where it shows us where the good life is. This is a miktam of David. We don't know what miktam means. But um, it is some kind of song, a tune or perhaps a, a style but this from David, King David, the messianic forebearer of uh, Jesus Christ. And he starts by saying that the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my refuge. This is his first plea. This is his request. The person who sings their song looks not to themselves for their own security and provision. They look to God. He is the place of refuge. Keep me safe, God. For in you I take refuge. I wonder if this is representative of yourself. Is this 
could you sing this song uh, with uh, complete confidence that this is you right now? Do you look to God for refuge? When things get tough, when, when the going gets rough, when you are faced with crisis, do you turn to the Lord for refuge? Or perhaps you turn to the bottom of a bottle? Or the binge of episode after episode? Do you retreat behind a, an, a wall of anger and hostility to find your refuge and safety? Perhaps you turn to your work and bury yourself under a mountain of work that will distract you from the trouble. But why? Why do we turn to these worthless saviors? These won't save us from anything. We will not find every, every, every true and lasting refuge and safety and security in these things. We need to turn to God. He is the refuge. He will preserve his people. He is a safe harbor on a sea of trouble. Pursue God. Ask him to rescue you. He is a faithful savior. And that's why David turns to him for refuge and prays for refuge. He's confident that he will have what he's asked for based on what? On everything that follows in the rest of this psalm. We see in the rest of the psalm where his confidence is coming from to find refuge with God. Let's look at the next part together. In verses 2 to 4, he says, The Lord is my good. The Lord is my good. And that's why he can have confidence. Because God is the source of all good. In fact, there's nowhere else David can turn to. There's nowhere else that we can turn to to find the source of all good things. And he'll even give an example of what happens when we turn elsewhere. Let's look from verse 2. I say to the Lord, now just pause there for a second. The Lord here, you'll see that in your Bibles, it's probably in capital letters, Lord. So this is the personal name for God, Yahweh. So I say to Yahweh, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, or some of your translations will say the saints who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take their names on my lips. So David's confidence in God keeping him safe, is because Yahweh is his Lord. He belongs to God. He belongs to the Lord. That's where the assurance comes from. It's because he belongs to God. The person who sings this song, their assurance is grounded there in belonging to the Lord. And that means rejecting all other lords, all other gods, other religions, other loyalties. Everything must bow the knee before the Lord God including us. And there we can find that confidence and assurance and security. You see, this is covenant language. Covenants are the, 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 uh, the kind of the relational agreement that two parties have together. And God has entered into a covenant with his people that he will love them and protect them and care for them and provide for them. And so David finds his confidence in knowing that he belongs to the Lord. He's in God's covenant. He expects to receive the covenant blessings because he belongs to the God, the one true living God, as opposed to anyone or anything else. And the blessings do come. The blessings come. David finds blessing with the Lord. He says, I have no good apart from you. I have no good apart from you. Apart from you, I have no good thing. God is the source of all good things. And David sees that truth for what it is. Now, this is so true. that Let me rephrase that. This is true for everybody. God is the source of all good things for all people. But there are a lot of people who don't realize it or recognize it. Everything good in this world is a creation of God or it comes from God. Everything good imaginable. 
it comes from God. Without him, there is no goodness. Outside God, there is nothing good, even if we don't recognize it. So David turns to the source of this goodness. And in doing so, he also sees the the people that belong to God, the holy ones, the saints. And he doesn't mean the saints as in uh, some select few holy people who have kind of achieved a, a level of perfection before they die. No, this is, he's talking about the people of God, the people of God who have been made holy by God. And so because these people are, are good um, because of what God has given them, because of what God has done for them, David can find his delight in God's people. He can find joy in them. He says, I say of the, oh, the, the saints who are in the land, they are noble ones in whom is all my delight. They are the people of God. And we would use the language now of talking about the people of God as the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, being made holy. These are the set-apart people who God lovingly chooses to save. God wants to find joy and delight in his people. And so we should find joy and delight in God's people as well, like David does. And like Christ does. Christ doesn't save us and purify us begrudgingly as if he was had his arm twisted behind his back and he'd been forced to do it. He does it because he loves his people, because he wants his people, because he wants to find joy and delight in his people, to purify them and save them. Some of us get into a, a bad place where we start to think of God's people as a bit of a burden. Because we know, if you've been around church for any length of time, you know that God's people are still pretty messed up. There's still hypocrisy. There's still backstabbing. There's still secret sins. Now, we want all of those things washed away. We are people seeking after God to see all of those things done away with, all of our secret evils, all of our open shame. But we shouldn't use the hypocrisy, the the blemishes in God's church as a reason to reject God's people or to speak ill of them. If Christ is willing to save this people and purify them and find delight in them, who are we to say, no, they're just a burden or they're all hypocrites or they're, they're still broken and sinful? Because of God's goodness flowing into his people, because of God's good relationship that he has with his people and what he has done for them, what he's doing in their lives, we can find delight in God's people. And the faithful one who belongs to God will not partake in any worship of other gods. No drink offerings. They won't pour out libations of blood. They won't even speak reverently about other gods. The one who belongs to God The one who finds refuge in him will not run after other gods. These saints aren't like this. But David here gives a quick example of what it looks like when somebody runs after other gods. And firstly, he says that they run, they chase after other gods. They are pursuing other gods. And in so doing, they are finding, they're finding evil they're finding what does it say they will find suffering more and more and interestingly the same word that means uh, this kind of word for chasing and running after other gods is the same word that is used for uh, a a man finding a wife so it's almost like saying these these people are courting other gods they are they are chasing after to to grab and, and court other gods They swiftly pursue them. But it only means swift pursuit of suffering. Because there is no good outside God. Anything that is apart from God or opposed to God 
running away from God. There is no good there. The faithful one who belongs to the Lord will not partake in those worship to other gods. And David has confidence in God's hands because he does not have these divided loyalties. He's not going to chase after these other gods. He is wholly devoted to the Lord God. He's not hedging his bets and trying to have a bit of God and a bit of other gods on the side or to put his faith and trust in God a bit but also in the works of his hands and what his wealth might secure him and what his education might do for him or his power and authority as king. No, no, no. He's not putting his loyalty and his trust in anything else other than the Lord God. And I wonder if we could say the same. Sure, we might not have a panel, uh, a pantheon of pagan gods lining the streets, uh, which we're tempted to go and give offerings to, to hedge our bets. We're not living in these ancient pagan times. However, there is still temptations for us to put our trust in other things other than God, to hedge our bets, so to speak, to go, well, I want to be sold out for God, but I'm going to keep all these other things on the back burner just in case this Christianity stuff doesn't work out. You need to be wholly given over to him, serving him and rejecting all other potential idols, all other gods. And for the people who do belong to him, the people who are given over to him, they find their inheritance. The Lord, my inheritance, in verses 5 to 8. David knows that there is no other way. He's 100% in for the Lord as the only source of good. And from the Lord, he receives good things. He receives inheritance and security. And and God provides for him and teaches him from verse 5. Lord, Yahweh, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise Yahweh who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on Yahweh. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. David here uses metaphors of the good life under God to explain what he has received from God. God is his food and drink. Which is interesting because shortly we're going to come and celebrate the Lord's table where we partake of Christ as our food and drink. But here... God is his food and drink, my portion and my cup. And God has given him the best plot of land. He's got a great property. It's got a good outlook. Get good outlook. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Now, you remember that uh, Israel, when they came to the promised land, they were given the promised land from God as part of entering into covenant with him. He said, I will give you the, the land. And the land was divided into pieces for each family, for each tribe. And then within each allotment for the tribes, there was uh, different uh, areas that would have been given to each family. And these allotments were to be passed down through the generations. Even if you sold off your land for some reason, maybe you fell on hard times, you had to sell off your land. It was really only a lease because after a certain period of time, the land was meant to default back to your family. And so each generation would inherit the land from those before them. And here David is using that picture of what he's received from the Lord. I've received a good inheritance. I've received a good land, the best land from God. I'm sure these are images that we could identify with. Now, I'm one of six kids, so in terms of inheritance, I'm not going to get much. But there is great joy in receiving an inheritance from those who have gone before whether it be land or whether it be something else. Many of us have received uh, wonderful gifts from our parents in the way that they have taught us and instructed us and raised us, disciplined us. We have received a great inheritance from the Lord. We've received good food and drink. We can all identify with that, that, that desire for feasting with the Lord, desire for feasting with one another. the desire for the best plot of land, the nicest place to live. But these are only shadows 
in comparison to what the Lord gives. It's like good food and drink. It's like receiving a great block of land. It's like receiving a good inheritance, but it's more. These are only kind of shadowy words that we can use to describe what we have received from the Lord. And because of the great inheritance that we receive from the Lord, David naturally flows into praise. He's then reminded of the Lord. I praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. And in, and in so doing, he's reminded of another blessing that he has from God. The Lord counsels him. The Lord teaches him. Even at night, my heart instructs me. You know, the, even at night, my heart instructs me. This isn't some kind of mystical thing where, you know, somehow in the middle of the night, um, he enters into some kind of mystical union. Or this, this is God teaching his people out of his covenant out of what he has given them, out of his word. And we even saw that in Psalm 1, that the, the righteous man is, or the righteous person is the one who dwells and meditates on God's word day and night. And so because David is, is that righteous man, he's being counseled by the Lord. The word of God is at work on him. It's instructing him. It's counseling him. And it's being bedded down even in the middle of the night as his heart chews on God's word. And this means that David can always keep his eyes on the Lord. The Lord is like his right-hand man. God is there to look out for him and to protect him and support him, and he will never be moved. Imagine if we could say these things about our perspective towards God. As you walk through day-to-day -day life, can, can you truly say, that I won't be shaken, I won't be moved, I won't be tossed about by whatever life throws at me because the Lord is at my right hand, because I look to Him. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Now, I don't want to... This psalm is a psalm of, uh, of joy and of rest. I'm not trying to lay these burdens on you of saying... Um, of continually saying how far fall you should... how far fall short you fall of this ideal but it is still worth remembering that we don't and that we need somebody who is going to look to the Lord somebody who's going to look to the Lord on our behalf who's going to do it perfectly for us because we can't do this perfectly we can't always keep our eyes on the Lord because we keep getting distracted but this is our hope and this is our prayer that we would be transformed and become these people who finds their full refuge with the Lord. And in finding our refuge in the Lord, we find our eternal joy. And that's what happens with David. He sees the Lord as his eternal joy. The Lord, my eternal joy in verses 9 to 11. Let me read verses from 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is glad. Therefore, because of what has gone before, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, or Sheol. Nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So because David has found this refuge, because he has found the good in the Lord, because he is looking to the Lord at all times, David can rejoice and rest secure. He has a hope, a hope that goes beyond the grave, as we see here. He, he says, my body will rest secure because you'll not abandon me to the realm of dead. And he, and he says there, you make known to me the path of life. God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And so David has hope, a hope that goes beyond the grave in the same way that Abraham, when he rose the knife, to strike his son, Isaac, that he had a hope that God would resurrect his son and bring life. David has a hope beyond the grave. He even, yeah. He doesn't fear death, abandonment to the realm of the dead, to Sheol. Instead, he knows blessing from God. And it's interesting how in that last verse, he, sh he, know he has a threefold blessing there that he sees from God. Three pieces. 
and in the way that Psalms are written, they are written, uh, as you see in your Bibles, that they often have the verse, they start the verse, and then there's a second line, which is often indented. And so this is a sign that these two parts of the verse go together. And they're often in, in two pieces or three pieces. And we call them a colon, a tricolon or a bicolon. And so Hebrew poetry, this Hebrew poetry that we most regularly find in the Psalms is not a matter of uh, does it rhyme in Hebrew it, or um, you know, other kinds of poetry that we might be used to. This is poetry that is... It lines up on kind of being parallel to one another. So the first half of the verse will usually be parallel to the second half of the verse. These are two ways of saying the same thing. Or it might be an extension. You know, the fir- because of the first part of the verse, then the second part of the verse. And in this particular verse, verse 11, we see here three things that are kind of three different ways of saying the same thing. Three things that come from God. The threefold blessing. God makes known to him the path of life. What's another way of saying that? That he has fullness of joy in God's presence. What's another way of saying that? That he has pleasures forevermore at God's right hand. He finds this blessing and this joy in the Lord. His confidence is there. You make known to me the path of life. There is fullness of joy in God's presence and there's pleasures forevermore at God's right hand. This is the ultimate result of belonging to God, of finding refuge in Him, of being secure with Him. If you seek after God, you will find this blessing. But this didn't literally come true, did it? For David... If we look carefully at these verses, we see he says, my body will rest secure. You'll not abandon me to the realm of the dead or let your faithful ones see decay. But David died. David remains dead to this day. His body has decayed to dust. So does that mean his hope was in vain? Does that mean he just kind of got it wrong on this one? Most of the time he was inspired by the Spirit, but just on this occasion he missed up. No, David is looking forward. He does have this hope beyond death. But Peter tells us from the other side of Jesus Christ that this psalm was looking forward to Jesus. It wasn't literally David in this moment because he did die and remain dead. But he spoke prophetically about Jesus Christ. And he talks about this in his Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2. He says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. And the apostles, we, are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Remember, this was at Pentecost where they were seeing the pouring out of God's Spirit. And Peter saw that this Psalm 16 was looking forward to this, where Jesus would not die and stay in the grave, but he would be resurrected to life. David had spoken prophetically about Jesus. Jesus died. He was crucified, nailed to that cross, and to make sure, he was stabbed in the side with a spear. But even though he died, he was buried in a tomb. He rose again, defeating death. Three days later, on the third day, He's defeated death. He has not seen decay. He has not seen corruption. His body was resurrected. And you know what? He offers that resurrection life to all those who would come to him and receive it from him. You don't need to be abandoned to the grave. You don't need to be abandoned to Sheol. Now, our bodies will die and dissolve unless the Lord returns. 
but we have a promise that we can have incorruptible resurrection bodies in Jesus Christ, like the one that he now has at the right hand of the Father. We may lose our life, but we have a refuge and a hope beyond death like David did. A hope that goes through the grave. A hope that ends with lasting joy in God's presence. A hope that, that, that looks to God to find joy and eternal pleasures at his right hand. But there is the alternative. Without Jesus, we are dead in our sin and abandoned the grave. Without Jesus, we have no hope of eternal pleasures at God's right hand. There is no lasting joy outside God's presence. Yes, you experience the goodness of this world now, but that goodness of God is a kindness to you right now. The goodness that you experience in life is a kindness to you right now. But unless you find life in Jesus Christ, unless you turn to him, one day God is going to say, you've experienced my goodness and you have continually rejected me, and I'm going to take my goodness away. He will withdraw his goodness from those people who will continually reject him. There is no lasting joy outside God's presence. So what do we do? What is the right response? Find refuge in God through Jesus Christ. And Peter from that same sermon tells us about how to do that. When he was speaking to that crowd there at Pentecost, he said uh, that, they, that people heard it, they were cut to the heart, and Peter said to the and the other apostles, sorry, they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This promise is for you today. You can repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit and you can be found in Jesus Christ, receiving the, the resurrection from the grave. To, res to find that eternal pleasure at God's right hand, to find that happiness that we truly desire. Repent, turn away from your sin, turn away from your vain pursuits and thank God for the goodness that you have already received and for the goodness that you might receive in Jesus Christ with forgiveness. Plead with the Lord to rescue you. Throw yourself on his mercy and then having been joined to him, take the sign of baptism. Take the sign of the covenant belonging to him, of having your sins washed away and having received the Holy Spirit. The Lord is calling you today to turn to him, to receive him. And for you who have already turned to him, who have already heard the call and who have already believed on him, rest in him as your refuge, as the one who provides for you, as the one who will give you everything you need, as the source of all goodness and of your eternal joy. Let's pray. Keep us safe, O oh God, for we take refuge in you. You are our God. You are our Lord, Yahweh, our covenant God. Apart from you, we have no good thing. Lord, we take joy in your saints and delight in your people. We recognize that those who run after other gods, other idols, will suffer more and more. And Lord, we will not worship other gods or take their names on our lips. But you alone, Lord, are our portion and our cup. You make our lot secure. The boundary lines for us have fallen in pleasant places and we have a delightful inheritance with you. We praise you, Lord. Who, you who teach us, who counsel us, even at night. We keep our eyes on you, Lord, and with you at our right hand, we will not be shaken. And therefore, Lord, our heart is glad and our tongue rejoices. Our bodies will rest secure because you will not abandon us to the realm of the dead. You will make known to us the path of life 
You will fill us with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand, because the faithful one, Jesus Christ, did not see decay, but was raised from the dead after dying as a sacrifice for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that in him we can have these blessings. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song in response. And then afterwards, we're going to join around the Lord's table.